Ulcerative colitis is a chronic inflammatory disorder of the large intestine. Ulcerative means ulcers formation, colitis means the disorder causes inflammation of the large intestine. Chronic disorder means that inflammation is persistent. Sometimes inflammation more severe, sometimes less, but disorder lasts for a prolonged period of time. Ulcerative colitis is autoimmune disorder, so inflammation is caused by autoimmune reaction. As any autoimmune disorder, ulcerative colitis more commonly affects women. And also, autoimmune reactions typically occur at a young age, so this disorder most commonly affects young people. The most specific feature of ulcerative colitis is that inflammation always starts in the rectum and then spreads through the entire colon. So, if rectum is not involved, most probably it's not ulcerative colitis. So, in ulcerative colitis, autoimmune reaction triggers inflammation that begins in the rectum and then spreads through the large intestine. So, if person has ulcerative colitis, rectum is always affected. But the extension of inflammation is different from person to person. And because of that, we subclassify ulcerative colitis on three major types based on affected area. If only rectum is affected, we call this ulcerative proctitis. If inflammation affects not only rectum but also spreads up to the splenic flexure, we call this left-sided ulcerative colitis. And if inflammation spreads from the splenic flexure to more proximal regions of the colon, we call this extensive ulcerative colitis. The state when the entire colon is affected, we also call pancolitis. So, it's three major subtypes of ulcerative colitis according to Montreal classification. But also we have to know that in severe cases, inflammation can spread up even to the ileum. And if inflammation also affects some portion of the ileum, we call this blackwash ileitis. Obviously, the more extensive is the inflammation, the more severe will be the clinical symptoms. And as we see, ulcerative colitis affects everything on its way, without any exception. So basically, ulcerative colitis is like fire in the forest. There is no skip lesions, it affects everything on its way. Once inflammation occurs, neutrophils and macrophages come in, and they begin to destroy intestinal tissue. And neutrophils, macrophages and colonic debris form substance that we call pus. And the specific feature is that pus in ulcerative colitis begins to accumulate inside the colonic crypts. And crypt with pus inside it we call crypt abscesses. So here we see outer layer that is composed of epithelial cells of the crypt. And inside it we see a lot of neutrophils that are the major components of the pus. And here is another example, also outer layer of epithelial cells and a lot of neutrophils inside it. Exactly these structures we call crypt abscesses, which are the signature feature of ulcerative colitis. So we have discussed the extension of inflammation. But how deep can be the inflammation? Severe autoimmune reaction cause injury to mucosal and submucosal layers of the colon. Even from the name, we know that this disorder causes formation of ulcers in the colon. And ulcer, by definition, is the lesion that affects mucosal and submucosal layers. But before ulcer, we have intermediate stages. To explain how ulcerative colitis progress, here we have intestinal wall, Intestinal wall consists of mucosal and submucosal layers, muscular layer and adventitia. So, if inflammation in intestinal tissue develops, initially it causes just an erythema. With time, if inflammation progress, inflammatory process causes destruction of the mucosal layer. And the type of injury when only mucosal layer is affected, we call erosion. Then with time, if inflammation becomes even more severe, Inflammation spreads to a deeper regions, which is submucosal layer. And a type of injury that causes destruction of mucosal and submucosal layers, we call ulcer. But important that typically ulcerative colitis do not affect muscular layer. So muscular layer remains intact. How we can diagnose intestinal injury? 
typically by low endoscopy. As we see initially, mild inflammation causes just an erythema. If inflammation progresses, it causes destruction of mucosal layer, so erosions develop. And if inflammation progresses further, with time also submucosal layer becomes affected, so erosions progress to ulcers. And generally, with inflammation, intestinal mucosa becomes more friable and thereby more prone to injury. Because mucosa becomes extremely friable, even the passage of food can cause mucosal injury that will manifest with cramping abdominal pain in the left lower quadrant. The reason is that, as we know, inflammation always begins in the rectum and then inflammation ascends to more proximal regions, as sigmoid region and descending part of the large intestine. And both these regions are located in the left lower quadrant. So it's the reason why most commonly patients will complain over the pain in the left lower quadrant. Because even passage of food can cause severe pain, patients will begin to avoid food, and food avoidance leads to a weight loss. Also, with such friable mucosa, any injury can cause damage to a blood vessel, and this can provoke intestinal bleeding. The deeper is the lesion, the higher is the risk of bleeding. In severe cases, with formation of ulcers, bleeding can be even spontaneous. Intestinal bleeding causes bloody diarrhea. Also, with blood loss, hemoglobin concentration decreases and the amount of red blood cells decreases, so anemia develops. Because blood leaks into the intestinal lumen, in the intestinal lumen, blood irritates nerve endings, and irritation of the nerve endings increases intestinal motility that provokes urgency to defecation. We call this tenesmus. And obviously, this will increase stool frequency. Severe inflammation in ulcerative colitis can cause decrease in tonus of tenia coli. As a result, intestinal house stress begin to disappear. To explain this, recall that intestine has folds that we call house stress. They are very prominent on X-ray. House stress are formed by cross-linkage of tenia with circular muscles of the muscularis propria. The left image shows normal X-ray and we see that intestine has folds and these folds we call house stress. On a second X-ray we also see house stress. But house stress are present only in more proximal regions. They are in dilated state, but at least they are present, which means that this region is not significantly affected by inflammation. But at distal regions we do not see any house stress at all. And absence of house stress is a sign of chronic severe inflammation. We call this lead pipe sign, which is a unique feature of ulcerative colitis. As we know, inflammation always begins in the rectum and then inflammation ascends and affects sigmoid and descending colon. And exactly these regions do not have any folds. More proximal regions have them, so probably these regions are not affected yet. Severe chronic inflammation as compensatory response provokes excessive regeneration. And excessive regeneration causes formation of pseudopolyps. Here we see a normal mucosal surface, which is absolutely smooth. And on the right side we see a mucosal surface of patients with ulcerative colitis. The concept is that chronic inflammation causes chronic damage to the colonic mucosa. And as a compensatory mechanism, chronic damage provokes an increase in the regeneration rate of the colonocytes. And because damage is chronic and very severe, sometimes the compensatory reaction is abnormally strong. And in this case, in some areas of the mucosal membrane, colonocytes proliferate so rapidly and extensively that isolated islands of regeneration mucosa begin to appear. They bulge into the lumen of the large intestine as polyps, and because of this, we call such structures pseudopolyps. The more severe is the ulcerative colitis, the higher is the regeneration rate, and thereby the higher is the rate of pseudopolyps formation. So, on the upper image, ulcerative colitis is certainly more severe. Hyperregeneration causes increase in mitotic rate and any increase in mitotic rate greatly increases the risk of mutations. 
Because of this, we consider ulcerative colitis a promalignant disorder, and pseudopolyps we consider a promalignant structures that greatly increase the risk of colorectal carcinoma. Recall that we said that typically ulcerative colitis do not cause damage to the muscular layer. Well, every rule has an exception, doesn't it? And the type of ulcerative colitis where injury occurs even to the muscular layer we call toxic megacolon. As we know, muscular layer is responsible for intestinal contractions and also muscular layer helps to maintain the constant shape of the intestine. Sometimes in ulcerative colitis inflammation becomes so severe that even muscular layer becomes affected. And with damage to the muscular layer, first of all, intestinal motility decreases, but also large intestine cannot maintain its shape. As a result, colon over distends, and such over distended large intestine we call toxic megacolon, and it's really severe complication of ulcerative colitis. How to diagnose toxic megacolon? The most important concept is that in case of toxic megacolon, lower endoscopy is totally contraindicated, and the reason is high risk of perforation. In case of toxic megacolon, perforation is possible even without major trauma to intestine, so it's a big deal. The diagnostic method of choice is X-ray. Here we see an X-ray of patient with ulcerative colitis. Unfortunately, in his case, inflammation was so severe that toxic megacolon developed. The major diagnostic feature of toxic megacolon is over distension of the large intestine greater than 6 cm. Because it's severe inflammation that causes intestinal over distension, the major criteria for toxic megacolon are signs of severe inflammation. It's fever, tachycardia, neutrophilic leukocytosis, and also anemia due to the blood loss. Systemic inflammation causes systemic intoxication that manifests as dehydration, altered consciousness, electrolytes disturbances and hypertension due to the blood loss and dehydration. So X-ray criteria and signs of inflammation are considered a major criteria and signs of systemic intoxication we consider as additional or minor criteria. So to summarize, Ulcerative colitis causes macro changes as mucosal and submucosal inflammation, mucosal friability, loss of haustras, and pseudopolyps that greatly increase the risk of colorectal carcinoma. Also, ulcerative colitis causes micro changes. On histology, we can diagnose cryptopsis, which is a hallmark of ulcerative colitis. But we do not see any granulomas because granulomas are the specific feature of Crohn disease. Because ulcerative colitis is autoimmune disorder that causes severe inflammation, ulcerative colitis has not only intestinal manifestations, but also systemic, or we call them extra-intestinal. First of all, it's a skin rash. There are two types of rash, it's erythromonodosum and pioderma gangrenosum. The second manifestation is eye inflammation, which manifest as episcleritis and uveitis, we call this red eye. Also, ulcers in the oral cavity can develop, we call this aftostomatitis. And also, systemic inflammation can cause arthritis. So, in ulcerative colitis, we have intestinal and extraintestinal manifestations. Intestinal manifestations are severe bloody diarrhea and abdominal pain. Extraintestinal manifestations can manifest as a rash, inflammation of the eye, oral alterations, and arthritis. So, which diagnostic methods we can use to diagnose ulcerative colitis? In ulcerative colitis, inflammation is very severe, and with inflammation, the amount of white blood cells increase, erythrocyte sedimentation rate increase, and C reactive protein increase. Also, to assess disease severity, we use calprotectin. So, increase in calprotectin is a sign of intestinal inflammation, which means the disease is in active phase. To assess the severity of intestinal injury, we use lower endoscopy with biopsy. And on biopsy samples, in ulcerative colitis, we can determine cryptopsis. 
So, because ulcerative colitis cause severe inflammation, there will be an elevation in ESR, white blood cells and fecal colprotectin. Fecal colprotectin is an extremely important marker that we use to assess disease activity. Because ulcers cause bleeding, ulcerative colitis cause blood loss. As a result, in ulcerative colitis, usually hemoglobin is low, red blood cells are low, and MCV usually less than 80 due to the chronic bleeding. Ulcerative colitis has one specific feature. Usually, in ulcerative colitis, P anca is positive. MPO anca or P anca is the same thing. But it's important feature because P anca is also positive in a couple of vasculitis and primary sclerosis and cholangitis. This feature can explain why people with ulcerative colitis more frequently have erythromonodosum or primary sclerosis and cholangitis if we compare them to the general population. The most common complications of ulcerative colitis are fulminant colitis, which is basically ulcerative colitis with very rapid progression. Fulminant colitis can cause toxic megacolon, and toxic megacolon can be complicated by perforation. So it's a pretty substantial reason not to do lower endoscopy in case of toxic megacolon. As a diagnostic method, we also use X-ray, where we can determine so-called lead pipe sign. And also, because we are afraid of colorectal cancer, we are doing regular lower endoscopy just for surveillance. Also, if signs of toxic megacolon develops, we are doing an X-ray, because in this case, low endoscopy is contraindicated. The major and the most specific drugs for ulcerative colitis is 5-aminosalicylic acid derivatives, it's mesalamine and sulfasalazine. As an additional options, we use 6 mercaptopurin and infliximab. These two drugs we also use for Crohn's disease, so they are non-specific. And as a last choice, in most severe cases, we use colectomy.